certain way people that kill people behave. And there's certain things you look for. It's not all telltale. But sometimes you just get a feeling. Welcome to Chasing a Murderer Talking News. My name is Debbie, and I want to ask you guys before we get started to please look at the like button right there. Click like. Also, hit the subscribe button that helps this channel out. Hit the notification bell if you would like notifications if whenever we have something new uploaded. So, we've been working on connecting the dots that has to do with the Lori Daybell. Valo story. So right now we are going to be jumping into this right away. We're not going to waste any time and talk about Chad Daybell and his belief system. Now because there is so many um, things involved with all the belief systems that Chad is believing in. It's very difficult to put a lot of it in here, so we're going to try to do the best we can. And so let's start off with what are light and dark spirits? For some healers and people that work with a spirit energy, meditation, this sort of thing, light spirits, they are spirits dominated by a loving type energy. They are also called good spirits, benevolent spirits, friendly ghosts angels, spirit guides, loved ones in spirit, God, higher self, finally a universal source of consciousness. So we have heard where Chad Daybell speaks with Tammy's grandmother quite often. That's one of his number one spirit guides, I would say, when it comes to somebody they know from that was earthbound at one point. Chad often used Tammy's I believe, this is my personal opinion, used Tammy Daybell's mother or grandmother. It's a grandmother. Sorry, guys. I hope I didn't say mother. It gets confusing. Um, uses Tammy's grandmother to kind of manipulate Tammy into doing what he wants her to do. And one of those things that he says that Tammy's grandmother tells him is that Tammy needs to get off the video games and start actually working back in the temple on the family genealogy. Of course, some of the other spirits that he's speaking to is through um, his portal that he creates, which we'll talk about later. And then spirits also through the temple. Supposedly, some of them being uh, the prophet Moroni, as well as God himself. So remember that Chad is able to walk in between two worlds and one is behind the veil where the spirit world is and one here on earth so what are dark spirits so according to a lot of um, spirit energy coaches and this sort of thing these are spirits dominated by non-loving energies also called demon earth bounds um, dark spirits and negative entities so a few examples of those would be Charles Vallow. Charles Vallow, which was Lori's fourth husband. He was supposed to die in a car accident, didn't. And after that, somehow his spirit leaves his body and a man who, who was earthbound, which is a darker earth entity, enters Charles Vallow's bo body by the name of Ned Snyder. Where did Charles' spirit go? Well, it's hard to say, but one place they mention is the fact that 
there's a possibility that his spirit will be in limbo until that spirit no longer is taken over Charles' body. And how can that be? Um, how can this problem be fixed? And so this is what we're hearing is through death. So Charles' body would have to die here on earth, release that dark spirit, and from there on, supposedly Charles Bellow would no longer be in limbo. Another example is Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. According to Lori Vallow, Melanie Gibb, Chad tells Lori that Tylee is now a zombie, meaning that her spirit is no longer in her body and the same for J.J. So them being zombies, they're most likely possessed with demons. And the only way that these demons are released are how? Through death. So they would have to die in order to release the demons from the bodies of those children. Now, if you go through a lot of the religious um, books where they talk about demons, you will find there is a lot of talk of exorcism. There's never once a mention that if the human body has been possessed by a demon or replaced by a demon that they go into a limbo until they die and so far what I'm researching I found nothing on this on the religious aspect of it however there is another possibility which we'll get to shortly we know that Chad was using a pendulum in order to mark somebody either a light or dark spirit and so a lot of what times people are asking how does chad sense these spirits i haven't spoken to chad personally but there's uh, another way that these spirit i don't know how to what to call these guys like spirit healers they give us four main signs that a spirit is nearby first sense an increased pressure around your head chest or the room around you sudden acceleration feelings of burst of energy indicate an increase of energy in your space number three is hearing whispering talking or humming around you and something else let's see here so number four feeling that someone is in the room with you but being unable to see anyone physically these are also signs that you might have some sort of mental condition that you might need to have evaluated some of it running into schizophrenia and I'm not a mental specialist so I can't go through them all and so when you feel those spirits or you feel their energy in that room it's at that point that you need to decide or identify what type of energy is present so at this point you need to decide what type of spirits you're dealing with so in the case of light light spirits these are loving spirits or guides angels or deceased loved ones who have crossed over completely and who are existing in spirit so these light sp spirits will assist you in your physical life when they are present you'll likely notice some of their telltale spirit present signs with some symptoms like tingling and you will feel this tingling in your head and in your body you also feel warmth they may feel um, you might feel like you are saved you might feel maybe it's an uplifting spirit that you are interacting with someone aligned with your highest and greatest good according to one um, spirit here healer she says that you will get this sensation of this loving energy which is dominated spirits that could potentially bring you much to a much higher place you generally want to keep them around these um, characteristics are also signs of a loving dominated spirit pleasant skin sensations such as tingling tickling warmth pleasant internal feelings of fullness warmth 
and just overall pleasant internal feelings of fullness, warmth, feeling as though you've been joined by someone. Also says that kind thoughts such as hearing gentle words of encouragement, supportive words, and funny words in your headspace. Loving spirits can have significant influential impacts on the ecosystem within the oceans around you. And they say that many of these loving, dominating, or dominated spirits gather their energy directly from divine light. Thus, they won't draw on your energy or resources to obtain their own. And again, they state that a loving spirit or the dominated spirit has a chance to impact your life profoundly. It's usually for the better. Now, for the dark spirits. Dark spirits are individuals who may not have crossed over into the light yet. They are individuals who live and lead a darker life and spirit path. These individuals are quite negative and their presence can promote feelings of disease and security and doubt. In this source that I found, it says, just as in life, people can change, so can those in the spirit world. Now, remember when um, Chad mentions in his ranking system, some things cannot change. But here in this source, it says that dark spirits are sometimes only dark spirits for a short time, where some can be crossed over, talked out of it, or changed to another way of existing. The source goes on to say that, however, at present, these individuals are not aligned with you for the outcome of your highest and greatest good. These spirits can bring down your energy. They tend to be defined as ghosts, earthbound, or entities who have specifically gone away from the light. So what we're sharing here is kind of odd because this doesn't seem to have the characteristics of a demon, does it? Just seems kind of be like a, a no-no ghost. Anyways, it says when a non-living spirits are present, you'll notice the telltale symptoms listed above as heaviness, sadness, isolation, still, and you'll see a few other additional characteristics. And those characteristics have to do with signs of a non-loving entity. But still, there's nothing there that says that any uh, spirit that takes over a body is a demon and that that uh, person that was originally in that body their spirit being in limbo until the death of their body so like I said it's very hard because Chad has multiple things going on that he's claiming is through the LDS attached to the Mormon now, in scriptures that they are learning through church, there are talk of something that kind of goes along with these ideas of spirit energy and stuff, but nothing major. Now, let's talk about the veil that Chad Daybell says that he's able to keep open. Firstly, what is the veil? The veil is um, a curtain or a boundary that separates the living world from the spirit world. So some people believe the veil must be preserved. They say the access to the spirit might be dangerous for us and that any bleed through from the other side could expose us to the threat of evil spirits, black magic, witchcraft, even demons. However, there's a few others that claim that the veil keeps, um, let me reword that. So, some people believe that keeping the veil actually helps us be able to understand there are two sides, at least to our world, and it allows for spiritual growth here in the physical world. So the separation of physical and spiritual realities is just one example of living like a dual life. Now, I'm not quite certain what this means, but this says that they say that the veil keeps us um, from being distracted by the beauty that lies beyond it and helps us stay focused instead of on the work we came to do here in the physical world. So you must remember the one thing about Chad Daybell is he claims 
he's had two near-death experiences, which is, well, there's no proof of that. And that his veil is always open. So he's walking in two worlds simultaneously. And that he can go back and forth between the earth and the spirit world. He's only one of the few that can do this. So according to some of the information that I found, there's various ways to penetrate the veil. For one example, millions of people have had near-death experiences in which they die temporarily, but they are revived and returned to us to tell us about their experiences. But it is said that we don't have to die physically to make contact with the other side. There are other less drastic means such as out-of-body experiences, meditation, visualization, hypnosis, mediumship, or channeling after death communications with loved ones and automatic writing. Now we do know that Chad Daybell mentioned that he was able to get that out-of-body experience, and his family's actually witnessed this. All I can say, if this was my father, I would have him admitted into a hospital immediately. That's what most normal families would do. But this family seems to find this stuff very normal. This is normal to them. This isn't odd. This isn't out of the way. So that's the interesting part of this. Some of these teachings that he's learning, he's learning that when we go to sleep, we can leave our physical bodies every night and travel beyond the veil to the spirit realms when we are dreaming. What should help you understand what Ian shares about what Melanie says about dreams that come to her. And there's some pretty concerning dreams. So I found a story where they talk about the veil in the Bible. Do you remember the New Testament story in which the temple veil was for rent or torn from top to bottom? In that moment when Jesus died on the cross? This story symbolizes an end to our belief in separation from spirit. It's basically saying that we can now enter into a presence of God. We are now free to enter the heavenly realms if we choose. And so some of these resources say, how can we benefit from penetrating the veil? It says we can benefit enormously when we are able to penetrate the veil by separating us from spirit. Here are some of the specific ways we can benefit. Now tell me, does this sound familiar to you? So the benefits are this. We can remember our past lives and the lessons that we learned during our past lives. We can apply those lessons to improve on our current life. While some people are claiming that Chad Daybell does not believe in reincarnation, he does because he's lived past lives. Anyways, another thing that they're saying is we can rediscover the lessons by uh, we sorry guys, pre-plan for our current life while still in spirit before incarnating this time. For example, person who is writing this says, I have learned why I came to live in Panama in this lifetime, thanks to a friend who channels ascended masters. Our experiences in this lifetime begin to make more sense when we are able to penetrate, penetrate the veil. He continues with, we can con contact loved ones who we already transitioned back to the other side. And they say they find that they're not really separated from each other after all. So, there you go. You have the combination between the Bible and the spirit healers, or spirit coaches. So, Chad's combining quite a bit of stuff and there's more out there I just don't have time to get, put it all in here and so many of these people say during meditation they have often journeyed beyond the veil and they encountered their loved ones who uh, transitioned back to spirit realms 
and all the way back to thousands and thousands of years. Some of them even have spirit guides in which they receive advice and encouragement. And so I'm not downing these people at all. I'm just letting you know they you know they believe that they're actually talking to true spirits from beyond the veil and possibly this is where Chad Daybell is learning what he understands that's involved with this case and the reasons for this is it's the same reason for sometimes some religions and that sort of thing and that's so people are afraid of death their fear of dying is very overwhelming you know to, le to leave this physical world is not something that is exciting unless you have something to believe in so in, if you believe when you pass away that you have this great um, beautiful city made of gold where you will have all riches and wealth anything you ever desired well that makes dying a little bit easier and so a lot of people like to think of heaven as what they um, often desire in their life or they tend to think about wherever the spirit world that they're going to it's also whatever they desired out of life because in reality, they're taking things that are of earth to these spirit worlds where there's no need for such desires. Now, this might make a little bit more sense to me. They're saying, some of these coaches are saying, you know, this lies behind the bell too. Once we achieve enlightenment, we may no longer need to reincarnate again and again uh, into this veil of tears or this physical world with pain and sorrows. But in Chad Daybell's teachings, he believes that he is a, he, you, it's clearly known that he's working towards something greater than peace and being happy with being an eternity. Chad Daybell is wanting to be something great, a leader. God. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Now I want to go ahead and end it here with this subject. Just remember that people that are teaching these types of things like Zalima, they teach things like the physical world is an illusion. Just that the veil itself is an illusion. So that kind of contradicts everything else. So let's talk about Chad Daybell's powers, his other powers, which um, don't forget, Chad has lived at least five lives, four past lives, lived on several different planets, and a lot of people who are keeping up with this case believe that, uh, or speculate that Chad learns the majority of this ritual ideas and practices from the Book of Mormon itself, whereas some of this stuff does come from some of the practices of the Mormon religion or the LDS. The majority of it that he's teaching has been enhanced by his own additions. So in reality, the truth is, he might have learned some from his lifetime, from his religious faith. It's mostly from the history not included in the books of the Mormon or the Bible. And remember, I said mostly. Now, because of the humankind's avalanche of religious information available, it is impossible to narrow down his influences 100%. So I'm just picking a few uh, ideas that I found, a few things that he were teaching, and just started researching. So on pendulums, we know because Melanie Gibbs says that she witnessed Chad Daybell using a gold pendulum to find and seek answers. Melanie Gibb is basically a practitioner of this odd faith that Chad Daybell and Lori's fifth husband are using. And their techniques used to rank their subjects up to certain, um, I don't know what word I should use for that. But um, 
certain ranking certain people who surround Lori Vallow. And the ranking system tells um, by each name says how many lives they lived, whether they're dark or light, etc., and so on. So, as I mentioned, Melanie Gibb witnessed several of Chad's pendulum moments. He swings a magic gold necklace or pendulum and then he asks a question. For example, is Joey light or dark? And so it is up to his pendulum in his hand and its original sway to, that is calibrated to him. So in reality, you could say that Chad was actually the deciding factor and the judgment and the fates of both Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow and many others attached in this case. So pendulums are used in several ways to tell, as far as like to tell time, to tell the future, and pendulums are known to be a divination tool used for spiritual healing by energy healers. And guys, if I don't get something exactly right, this is because this is all new to me. This is a bundle of information that I just untied and it just exploded all around me. But anyways, the idea behind the pendulum is that it can bring subconscious energy into a conscious awareness to give you answers to the questions you may have. Of course, you should always use them for your highest good. And according to Chad, now he, his wife is gone, Lori Vallow's husband is gone, and her two children are gone. He believes, I guess, he's using this um, type of judgment system for the better good. But like all things Chad does in the name of good, it's opposite day. Same applied for Lori. He has nothing holding him back from marking. Um, an innocent husband, Charles Vallow, who was trying to save his wife, Lori Vallow, from herself and his two children from Chad's judgment or mark. And if you really think about it, close your eyes. Imagine Chad Debo holding a pendulum in his hand seeing it slowly sway back and forth while he asked the questions you know is Tylee Ryan dark or light Chad has the heart to mark these children to their doom with just one sway of this golden pendulum most importantly he doesn't waver from the trust of that golden pendulum either and he sends this information to his lover at the time, Lori Vallow, who also supports the outcome and the answers coming from that swinging pendulum. So guys, I have so much I can share on this, but I do want to quickly, I might actually chop this down. Now it's not for certain. I did not see it. I did not hear anything. But I'm only guessing by the use of this equipment that he's using that most likely his use of the pendulum is most likely surfacing from witchcraft. Spiritual healers also use these pendulums and of course, and of course some of it could be coming from that. But for Chad's use, I would like to say that it's mostly, um, it's not the white witch. It's the dark, it, whatever he's using, it's coming from the darker side of whatever it is. So most witches do use like a, a spirit bells or pieces of bone from a wolf, I think, or a coyote from the foot as pendulums. And so the reason why I think that he's using the witch's side is because these pendulums will allow you to go into the dark side or the dark and then return to the light. But I could be wrong. I mean, this is just uh, something that we can consider. So I don't really want to go any deeper into the pendulums because it's basic. It's basic. It's, he's seeking answers. I could go into how they charge it and all this other stuff because there are uh, ways that these pendulums have to gain energy. And there's proper ways to use them. But this could go 
I don't want to take away from the important aspects of this video because I'm really wanting to get into um, the Satan part of this. This is kind of controversial. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, something called the magical parchments. This is something that they found relatively recently and they found it within uh, a family that was attached to um, Joseph Smith and the Mormons. I don't know a whole lot about it, so I'm just going to do a brief summary of this. So, the Smith family supposedly owned three magic parchments that were carried in a bag meant to be worn by the owner. And so, what they're saying is that these parchments kind of blend the mixture of Christianity and magical occult symbolism. Okay, and were probably used as layman's pendants meant to focus focus magical energies for a variety of purposes now what these uh, books and online uh, research are saying about this stuff is that the existence of these parchments suggests that the Smith family had more um, than passing interest in magic so this makes you wonder if uh, Chad not saying that the LDS is teaching this but Chad is searching for these types of things and kind of adopting this into the legitimate or true form of the LDS and its practices. So many of the magic symbols are copied and directly out of magical texts, including the, and guys, I've never heard of this stuff before. So the Magus by Francis Barrett, published in 1801 as well as the complete illustration of the celestial sciences by Ebenezer Sibley which was published 1784 and finally the discovery of witchcraft by uh, something Scott published in 1584 now there's absolutely no proof that the Smiths had that they seen this in the Smiths hands but there's rumors and there's some physical evidence of these items and these evidence come from a family called the Hiram Smith family who carried these um, items as heirlooms of their family but still guys I mean this is their word anyways their provenance isn't clear so just an idea that not trying to down the church at all but trying to figure out where Chad might have got these ideas. Now through history there's been point of fingers of other religions that use magic and the Pharisees uh, when they are they actually accuse Jesus of witchcraft in Matthew 12 22 and 32. It says so we have second lead that he is using witch magic. So this is something that Chad would have maybe seen or took in as something that people are trying to hide because that's the way that he lives he lives in a world where anything he believes in and practices is behind closed doors even from the, the very people of his faith but the rumor is on these parchments is that this stuff likely belonged to Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr. But these things were inherited by Hiram's family. And this is after Joseph's death. And so that, I think they're, the Hiram death was, well, one, the one that they're speaking about is 1844. It's quite a bit of a time to finally see you know these parchments so these part parchments are now the property of a private collector and only a few photographs um, have been witnessed and seen you know I would love to see you know everything that's involved with this so there are other things out there attached to Joseph Smith like the seer stone and a man who claims to actually had an eyewitness account of Joseph Smith using this seer stone wrote, quote, In writing for your father, I frequently wrote day after day, 
after sitting at the table close to him. He is sitting with his face buried in a hat with a stone in it and dictating the Book of Mormon, Mormon hour after hour with nothing between us. And so let me cite this for you. Um, you can find this in the creation of the Book of Mormon by Lamar Peterson. And it's on page 25. Now remember the date that I mentioned earlier. Earlier, As early as 1822, Joseph Smith was connected with a magic seer stone uh, he found while digging a well for Mr. Chase. It's also said that Joseph Smith and his contemporaries lived in a culture steeped in biblical ideas, terminology, and practices. These are things like the story of Moses and his brother Aaron describe the use of physical objects also such as rods to manifest God's will so they're using um, um, rods and these sort of things in order to communicate and call on God and I believe you can find that in Exodus 7 9 and 12 so what I wanted to show you here is, yes, there is a few teachings, and they're not, there's not very many, where they use objects in order to get revelation and that sort of thing. But nothing really to kind of, to use it for the fate of someone they love. And so, if you don't know what a divining rod is, this is something that has been used for centuries they were used for locating underground sources of water mineral and petroleum deposits and even lost objects so mostly for the christians uh, attached to joseph smith's days they regarded these divining rods as instruments of revelation so that's really important to pay attention to that for those of you who are trying to attach the, li the religion to chad's evil deeds there is no doubt in my mind that Chad seems more in tune with the magical side of everything while Lori is for um, the greatness, being this great Lord. And if you want to know, Jesus Christ was considered a healer because he would go around and heal people. But he would heal things like leprosy and thing, things that are actually physical. So there's proof of this. Whereas these healers that Chad's attacked to, attached to, really, they're just doing more damage and it's fraud. It's just straight up fraud, guys. Okay, now we're going back to visions and healing. Now remember the layman used by uh, Joseph Smith? These laymans were used by a group of German Christian faith healers called Brecker High to bless the individual and heal them or themselves. Now, according to Michael Quinn, the symbols and the names on the layman's were used to call upon the powers of specific angels associated with curing depression. So we know that Joseph Smith's parents suffered from this type of thing. Uh, this faith healing system came out of the aftermath of the radical form, uh, reformation and the 30 years war. Now this practice of the Brackerai, you'll often hear it also being mentioned as powwow. Anyways, it's uh, it actually is based off of Christianity but incorporates beliefs and characteristics of many other cultures, practices, and religions including American Indian, Jewish, Celtic, and many others guys. And according to history, the elements of the Baccarat can be traced back to ancient Rome. Those who practiced Baccarat were known as Brockers, and I hope I said that right. Now, there are a few people trying to keep this tradition alive, and one is, she goes by the name Toby. While few people denounce her efforts as a traditional healing uh, specialist, she insists that it works. Not because of any power she has, but because of the power of God and the Holy Spirit, which flows through her to the patient. She says, quote, I can't do the healing. 
All I can do is open myself to the power of God, end quote. But many, many people believe that this powwowing is associated with witchcraft and black magic. History says that this powwowing can even exercise demons. But a long story st short, I don't want to go in too much for this. I just wanted to mention the fact that this could also be another source that people like Chad are using. From here, it gets much more interesting. I'm going to start off by talking about visionaries. There are numerous visionaries within the Mormon religion itself. That includes the LDS and any other branch you can think of. But then you always have the ones like Chad Daybell, Lori Vallow, Julie Rowe, David uh, Warwick, and Zalima Palestine, who claim to be visionaries of this Mormon faith, but they're also attached to other occult-type things. This goes along with their self-proclaimed, um, well, they believe that they're energy healers as well, a lot of them. There's a man that's well-known within the Mormon community. President Russell Elm Nelson wrote in a message to the Mormon members, just as God listened to Joseph's prayer in uh, 1820, he listens to you and yearns to speak with you through spirit. So visionary gifts are something that is very common for these people. This is something they share openly to one another, but not so much to the people outside of, you know, their group. So Melanie Gibb mentioned that Lori Bellow had visions herself of her then-husband Charles Vallow dying. And she was actually greatly disappointed when that didn't happen. While in other um, documents, it is said that Chad Daybell was actually the guy that had the visions of both Charles and JJ dying in a car accident, which never happened. If this is true, Lori writes Chad Daybell and asks, you know, was very disappointed in the fact that they hadn't died in this car accident. And what we hear is when Valo got in contact, she devised a plan, or he did, and he... That's the scary part of it, guys. When this accident didn't happen to Charles and JJ, Chad Daybell tells Lori Bellow that Charles, his body had been taken over by unclean spirits and that Charles is no longer Charles. Now, something I want to touch on. I want to talk about Satan a little bit. And I don't know how to put this quite in the order I need it. So first, you must understand that according to the Mormon cosmology, there was a pre-existence or a pre-mortal life in which human spirits were little, literal children of heavenly parents, meaning that their parents were in heaven and that those parents made children while in heaven. Although their spirits are created and essential intelligence of these spirits is, um, well, considered internal and without a beginning. I'm trying to do a quick overview, so... This is how they uh, foresee Satan anyways. Lucifer, who is Satan, assisting on it, its exclusion. When Lucifer's plan was not accepted, he rebelled against God, the Father, and was cast out of heaven, taking third part of the host of heaven with him to earth, thus becoming the tempters. And so, we have heard many, many times that Lori speak about the fact that Satan is constantly after her. Earth is but only a testing ground. It has no real life value in Lori's eyes. So this is why it's so easy for Lori to see demons, Satan, and what she believes spirits are who are mobile. It has some idea as to why she thinks that her husband, Charles, his spirit has suddenly died for no apparent reason. And that old, an old friend of Charles' spirit who had died years ago has now entered Charles' 
body. So the same goes for Tylee and J.J. Vallow, her children, whose spirits are now in limbo because dark spirits took over their bodies. She addresses these bodies taken over by strange spirits as zombies. So where does this idea of zombies come from? Have you heard of a game called Dungeons and Dragons? To the casual player, it seems basic and simple, but not to a very deep player. There are some pretty very, well, serious and powerful characters with connections to face and, fo and folklore of the human history. Now, I don't know how to put this in order quite how to approach this with you because most of us are, are not aware about this game or the characters involved. One of those characters have been mentioned in various religious doctrines and he is the demon or known as the devil as Asmodeus. He has the power to control his victims or clergy by taking over their bodies. Osmodius is definitely a supreme leader, so let's get to know who he is first before we compare how I believe this is attached to this case. Osmodius was a lawful evil creature with the goal of becoming a supreme being in a multi-universe, even if it required destroying the current multiverse and creating a new one. Osmodeus is described in both character and games as well as biblical um, documents as a very lustful being and also one of the most evil beings to exist ever. Now, he has been actually compared to Beelzebul, Beezable, I don't know how to say his name, but supposedly that is one of the greater devils and demons as well. Asmodeus has several generals and, dis and what he calls followers or disciples. And they conquer layer after layer of hell, leaving only serpents own domain of um, I guess it's Nigeria alone. But it, the point is, is it's after this war, Asmodeus has gathered his greatest followers, or boons, and he names himself Lord of Hell. According to the Book of the Damned, it claims that he was one of the first born spontaneously from a mysterious source of life. So this spontaneous, mysterious source of life is known as the seal and began as a formless moat of energy. From there, the seal birthed other lesser moats and the first became self-aware. So just so that you have an idea that this Asmodeus has something to do with discovering speech, etc. and so on. He is like the main creator. And trying to cut this down as much as I can, Osmonius and his brother together with lesser gods began to sculpt creation into their liking and slowly introduced the concept of order into reality, such as creating stars, planets, and fundamental laws that bind them. They are responsible for creating mortals with free will causing the first um, uh, <laughs> where they start to create gods and between those of Smodius who viewed mortals as mere tools and those um, who desired freedom for creations most of all he's responsible for the concept of souls and worship so some kind of war or dispute develops between Osmodeus and his brother, which I'm going to skip all that because there's a lot to this, guys. Osmodeus is devastated by his brother's actions, and then he causes chaos and destruction that had sowed, and just know that his brother believed that good came from mortals' free will. 
who opposed Osmodius. And this is where Osmodius offered his hand in brotherhood and then performed the first act of treachery, murdering his own brother with a great spear. But what, what was really strange is in a strange act of sympathy for his now murdered brother, Osmodius allowed his brother's dream of freedom to stand. He then created hell as a monument to the old ways of the absolute merciless order. And um, it was like a warning of what would one day make a new. So he was also fixated on end times. According to the concordance of rivals, when the end times come, a desperate um, Osmodius will free another demon that is imprisoned i don't know how to say his name ravagog uh, who is sealed away in the hope that he will consume the other apocalypse so i kind of wanted to share the mention of um, apocalypse attached to osmodius hang in there guys we're getting to something we might recognize so the prince of hell preaches strict discipline and unwavering devotion from his worshipers the strong should rule the weak and the prince of darkness expects flattery from his flo uh, followers appreciating um, all of that flattery for what it is and delights and deals with contracts that secretly favor one party over another does that sound familiar to you guys so that's very familiar to what chad and Lori are doing they're kind of living one lifestyle with the LDS and in just everyday life when behind closed doors they're doing secret deals and contracts they're li living a very secret life so as Modius priests usually dress in clean and orderly red accented black dresses and often wear horn masks and helmets for ceremonies Clothing worn is usually expensive and clearly so, as the faith preaches that wealth attracts wealth. And here they kind of mention that in countries not under a certain yoke, priests are expected to abide by local laws and take sacrifices only from willing victims. So we hear the word of sacrifice here. There's also mentioned that it is very common for individual priests to offer the sacrifice of an animal before preparing spells. So here we go. This should start getting a little bit more familiar to you. So Asmodeus, um, compared to Lori and Chad when it comes to temples. Now for Asmodeus, many of his temples were originally dedicated to other gods and later acquired by his faithful to serve their profane purposes. While in churches of other deities, Osmodius is most often depicted as the adversary or the foil. The church of Asmodius, Asmodius always shows him in a position of dominance with other gods bowing down before him. Now, I want to remind you guys that I'm doing my very best trying to cram in so much information in so little time because I am not, I'm not familiar. I know I grew up Baptist, okay, but I never, never really took it seriously. I never studied any of the texts, so everything in this case is humongous and very diverse, and it's a lot to take in. And I'm doing it within days. So forgive anything that might, you know, not be so perfect. So remember, we're talking about D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons. And there's a reason for that. Like Chad, Asmodeus passes down his greatness to his followers. Remember, when Lori says, quote, if Chad is Satan, he sure is a good one, end quote. I don't know about you, but many, I wonder, what ever brought that subject up in the first place? These are people of God. Why would she suspect that Chad is a demon or Satan? 
So Ian mentions in the documents something about Dungeons and Dragons, zombies, and God. This is enough keywords to go on a search. The closest character to Chad is the Archangel or Arch Demon Osmodius. That's what I found so far that fits in with all the keywords. There's more than what I listed. So remember, Osmodius is is the supposed to be the greater deity. He is older than the concept of faith itself. Now it says that his character that um that deities like him neither waxed nor waned with the number of worshippers and beyond him. He had no ab ability to grant spells to his followers. However, there is one way for mortals to gain spells from him and that's by becoming a disciple and remember Asmodeus believes that the strong should rightfully govern the weak who in turn owe their master unwavering obedience so like Alex Cox to Lori or Lori to Chad he loves negotiations contracts especially those that give one of the parties a distinct hidden advantage over the other which Chad has done before. We'll talk about it soon. He expects and appreciates flattery. Okay, so there was a woman that goes by the name by, of Suzanne Friedman. She is actually one of Chad's first authors to have her work actually published through their company called the Spring Creek Book Company. That book company was launched in 2004. Freeman had also had a near-death experience, and over the next eight years, she partnered with Chad on two of her book projects. And East Idaho News has a lot on this. Freeman believes that Chad is this great, honest man, and this is based on the fact that she says that she finds him very humble. Chad even writes about meeting his first um, author, Miss Friedman, on his website back in August of 2015. And he talks about her near-death experience. Now, he's saying that he questions her authority, basically, of whether she's telling the truth. He says, quote, before I consider publishing this, her story, I wanted to make sure her account stayed uh, consistent within itself. So Chad kind of says in this blog of his that he's kind of questioning what she believes in. So he says, quote, before I consider publishing her story, I wanted to make sure the account stayed consistent within itself. So I began asking her many questions to see if she would slip up or change her story. And while Chad was questioning her as whether she was telling the truth, and that she legitimately had a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. She mentions that there's a possibility that he never had one. And she says this by saying he never mentioned that he had a near-death experience. We had a lot of conversations, and I would think that might come up. But she says it never did. Now, working towards the point that I'm trying to get at, Freeman ends up leaving Chad's book company. It's after her third book is released back in 2014. It's in, during this time that Chad suggests that they combine all three of her publications and he also suggests that they remove the LDS references to make the story more mainstream. She also mentions that he began working on projects that concerned her. She said that she remembers him being supportive of the LDS. Freeman knew that he was supportive of the LDS at the beginning, but she said, quote, he started publishing non-Mormon doctrine stories, people's different experiences and stuff. And I just told him there's something not quite right. And she mentions again, plus, we were working on a book of mine together to take out the LDS stuff, and I was kind of surprised by that because he was an LDS author, end quote. 
Chad came to Freeman and he tells her that they would be closing his business because of the call out and it was coming. This is meaning that they're um, about to prepare for the apocalypse, the second coming, and they are gathering. So Freeman explains what it is, quote, the prophet will one day before any tribulations will be called out to go to the LDS ch own church girls camps. Only those who have their food storage and temple recommend will go. She says that um, he felt that this was going to happen and I think it was July so he was going to stop publishing books in quote. Now his beliefs are this according to Freeman. Chad believed that the righteous would live together until the earthquakes and calamities happen ahead of the second coming of Jesus Christ. While Freeman is not a big believer in this, she says she had heard about these ideas online and chat rooms and forums, but they didn't make sense to her. So it's important that you pay attention to the fact that she too says she don't think it would be safe if you go somewhere where the government knows where you're at. There's a lot more to this, but I'm going to have to separate it. And guys, what you hear in the background are my birds. So anyways, Chad and Freeman, they go their separate ways. And according to Freeman, she said that Chad promises to give her her book rights back. But when he didn't, she had to hire an attorney. Now remember where we left off with us modus. His contracts are very one-sided. Freeman says, quote, I went to an attorney and he read through the contract. He said, I have never seen a publisher's contract this one-sided. This has nothing good for you in it. So this is really surprising to Freeman because she really thought she was a great judge of character. And this guy, Chad Daybell, seemed to be the type of guy you could trust. But she's finding out he's not so trustworthy and she says after learning what that contract was about quote I thought this was just not honest I thought give me my rights back that's what I want I don't want my name attached to what he's publishing I'm not believing in that and I want to be left alone in quote no, we could consider that these are just people who left on harsh terms, but comparing the information to other people, it's right in line. And she's probably being completely honest. Moving back to Osmodius. So he's the same way. He has these very unfair contracts. And why am I mentioning this name so many times? And so we will learn that as well shortly. Now remember that I mentioned that Osmodius, as well as uh, Beasible, and I don't know if I ever say his name correctly, which is basically the same guy, Satan, is considered in some teachings to be the, o the oldest deity in existence. They are the creator of everything. If you are learning about this subject, you can refer to the Book of the Damned. And what's important to remember is... There's something that uh, Osmodius, he has this dream, and the dream is to build a temple, and he wants to use his servants, his um, disciples, there's many names that they go by in order to create this temple. So in one of the descriptions, he is described as, is he has in turn shared many of heaven's truth and innovations to the uh, people that follow him before returning to heaven keeping the route to hell a secret to all but himself in some writings it says that he even led his followers which are big big people like his protege Be Beasible and some of the strongest demons in existence leading them to hell promised that you know to escape from heaven's bureaucracy and their obsession with mortal life and so the goal was to conquer every layer in existence in this universe and become the god of all things 
So, in the game Dungeons and Dragons, Chad and Asmodeus, they kind of have the same um, goals. And again, I want to mention the fact that Lori says if Chad is Satan, then he sure is a good one. And we need not forget that this, uh, some of this stuff comes from the descriptions that Ian writes in later documents, which actually are happening in December. He writes that there were fun and exciting ideas, but I felt like many of them were ripped straight out of the Dungeons and Dragons manual. And again, how would he know this? How would he know about Dungeons and Dragons and things about the character Asmodeus, which I feel pretty confident about that's who he's referring to. He mentions that they have stats, and on these stats, the person was ranked by their levels of vibration, libido, trustworthiness, then finally, the one that everybody knows very well, between their whether they're light or dark percentage, is more on the light side or the dark side. But still, we hear these things where they're talking about um, zombies. These zombies are human bodies that have had their original spirits forced from them and have been possessed either by a demon or the third of the heavenly host who followed L Lucifer. They also say that they could be uh, possessed by disembodied spirits. So these are spirits that were once living in human spirits who have chosen not to be reborn into another probation or a worm or slug creature controlled by Lucifer that enters the body to control the host. So that's definitely uh, Asmodeus that he's referring to in some of this documentation. Charles Vallow's previously released divorce documents state some very concerning things that kind of match up to what Ian's saying. And so Lori is claiming to be a translated being the documents reportedly written by Ian Pawoski offer more details about these beings and that the translated beings cannot die, cannot reproduce, and they cannot or rather don't need or have no need for eating, sleeping, uh, and do not feel sorrow of the world. Notice they did not say that they didn't require sex. And we've heard this multiple times, but I need to make sure I mention this, that Ian claimed that there are 50 translated beings in this world. Two of them just happen to be Rexburg police investigators. Vallo and her fifth husband, Chad Debo. So what does that even mean? What is a translated beating? So they're saying that they have spies inside the um, police force, or are they saying that there's something evil? They could also be referring to Jason Mao, who is an ex-police officer. So, But anyways, let's see where they're getting some of these ideas. So you have Matthews 12, 22, and 32. This is where Amodius appears as one of the demons who is forced to help build uh, Solomon's temple. Unfortunately, Asmodeus proved to be too powerful for his slavery. And it says that when his roving eye fell on Solomon's beautiful wives, he decided enough was enough. He hurled Solomon 400 miles into the desert, then disguised himself as the king and took over the palace as well as his wives. I want to mention the fact that Jesus was able to actually um, exercise demons in his time. So going back to the story on Solomon, what he's trying to do is bend the wheel of the demons to do his bidding. I'm going to hop around a little bit, guys. I'm sorry. So Solomon receives this thing that ring from the archangel Michael. He bends the wheel of these demons to build this temple with that object. So he's using this object to command Osmodius and to build this temple with three levels which is very similar to um, the mormon temple and so i don't know if i ever mentioned that osmodius is actually the sign of envy murder 
all these evil things that men have been or created. And he's also known as the destroyer of all worlds. So you have Solomon who is using this, you know, object to try to control this evil entity and to build this great temple, which is complete opposite of destruction. So I think I have pretty much narrowed down that there's a possibility that Chad isn't even following any type of word of God at all. Instead, he might be following this character known as Asmodeus. So here's one description of what Asmodeus looks like or what his true form is. And they say that his true form is that of a wingless scaled serpent hundreds of miles long. His form's sheer size made it impossible for him to meet and enter into conversations with others. And guys, you can go online. There's tons of stuff about this guy and his character in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I can't cover it all. You need to go check it out online. Interestingly, Lori and Chad both, they deem people to be dark or zombie spirits who do not think like they do or agree with whatever they're teaching or saying. Likewise, so do some of the demons like Beezable and Asmodus. Anyways, um, Beezable would create like a humanoid avatar for himself. And so his body was kept in secret from everyone, including other devils. So other people and the same um, click as him. So let's think about Chad Daybell Hill. Here, we'll talk about that in just a second. And those... Who learned the truth about his body they were killed within a day so that's kind of interesting so when they deem you know police officers officers dark or K dark they're actually learning about their true teachings they know the truth they know who they really are so that's something you need to think about also what I want to mention, I'm just throwing this in here because I kind of got this one a little bit of a mess trying to hurry. It's really hard to get this together sometimes. Now remember that his 10 avatars held a ruby rod of Asmodeus. Remember that. Ruby rod. Now another thing that's quite interesting is they say that his threshold for rewarding someone is fairly low, provided that someone is willing to sign away his or her soul. But shockingly, once this mortal worshiper is dead, what awaits him or her is eternal servitude. So the personality of Osmodeus versus Chad Daybell, the ruler of the 144,000. Online, it says that Asmodeus was a lawful, evil creature with the goal of becoming the supreme being in the multi-universe, even if it required destroying the current multi-universe and creating a new one. But no one knows what that, um, how he was going to do that. It is a known fact that Asmodeus wanted to take over the multi-universe for himself. And considering that he's an evil being, he genuinely believed that. A bright future awaited the multi-universe if he was to rule it. So another interesting comparison, um, according to descriptions of Osmodius, is that he presented himself as confident and a very knowing man who was quite reasonable to talk with. In fact, it was quite difficult to see past his manners and realize that he was an evil person who presided over hell basically his confidence was real and rooted in his knowledge to be one of the most powerful creatures in existence also he was not above pretending to, to know more than he did very coincidental and once more i want to mention that his threshold for rewarding someone was fairly low providing that someone was willing to sign away his or her soul and just in case i want to also mention that he was able um to give mortals a way to gain spells from him and um, this is by becoming a disciple of darkness i wonder if melanie gibb understood just how dark she was getting 
So what this means that on the mortal side, this agreement meant that the archangel could take the life of the mortal at any time he wanted if he was not appeased with the sacrifices. Hence, you know, all these deaths happening around Lori and Chad. This seems to fit in pretty well, doesn't it? What's pretty interesting is the method through which Amodius granted spells was not through his own powers, but through using himself as a channel for divine magic of the theater itself to the mortal clergy. Now, also interesting, Osmodius within the Dungeons and Dragons game would uh, any enemy or everyone within 120 feet or 37 meters of Asmodeus avatar was under the effect of a what um, which made it impossible for people to attack him when they were not attacked first by the avatar also what's interesting here the most interesting fact is this character is able to cast a spell that reanimates the dead. So his powers were to animate the dead, blasphemy, charm monsters, create greater undead, desecrate, detect magic, and devil's ego. Now, remember, Chad does use portals. Well, likewise, Asmodeus, the devil, by devil's law, only Asmodeus could issue letters of safe passage that did not uh, cover one layer, but for travel between layers. However, he never issued such things for Nexus, which is a complete different thing. I'm just giving you an idea here that he's able to use portals. Remembering that Charles Velo was fatally shot by Lori's brother, Alex Cox, outside of Phoenix in July, Alex Cox pleaded self-defense and was never charged and the murder of Charles Velo. So it's during right after this that we're, I think they start using this portal to their advantage. I'm sorry guys, I'm having to hop around and really there's just so much information. I don't have time to do it all. I can make a, probably seven movies off of this one case in itself. So referring back to um, Adam and Eve and Satan, and also the fact that uh, the quote that Lori made was kind of questionable. If Chad is Satan, then he sure is a good one. This is kind of similar to Adam and Eve, and that is because Satan began tempting Eve to mistrust God and his word by changing the meanings of his words. And guys, I could go into this so much. And I feel bad because I can't really cover everything that we could. Just cutting it short. Like Lori, Eve, rather than rebuking Satan or the evil, Eve entertained his lies and was uh, deceived by his crafty arguments. Which is, if you understand this case and the people involved, that is something they like to do is throw verses at each other. This is something the entire group involved with Lori does. They're very crafty and they like to use their words to prove a point. And so what's interesting is Satan is also teaching them and he's bold enough to accuse God of being a liar. So he tempted the pride of Adam and Eve by declaring that if they disobeyed God, they could in effect become divine peers and gods themselves. And so this quote makes me think back not only to Chad and Lori, but Joseph Smith himself and the entire religion respectfully. It's incredibly so much like the heavens from um, the Mormon teachings and the celestial kingdom. So Eve was faced with trusting in her own judgment or God's protective warning that the fruit was deadly. Satan promised that upon sinning against God, they would become like a God. Yet they were already like God by virtue of the fact God made them in his image or likeness. So basically, Adam and Eve they're wanting to be worship 
and exalted like a god themselves like many people that is involved with this case and many people in life period they want to be this great person that everybody looks up to but i did notice within the prayer uh, preparing the people the majority of that group like um especially melanie gibbon i don't think she realized it as well as david and uh lori chad melanie boudreaux the whole works of them they are just wanting to be the special people who is attached to as being one of God's number one mentors and leaders or God itself. So a prophet, God, disciple, one of those. You can choose. Now I found a lot of information on this and I'm going to have to end this here, guys. It's just so much. And so this is not what I had in mind for connecting the dots nine, but here we are. And so this was very, very important. It's trying to figure out, and this isn't positive. This is just an idea. This is speculation that possibly Chad Daybell is actually admiring Asmodeus more than he is God because I compared the two and he definitely favors this character out of the uh, Bibles and teachings and Dungeons and Dragons. So I want to ask you guys to please look at these faces here. These are important. These girls are still missing. They need our help. Share this video. Share these girls' faces. And I want to send my love and say thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for caring. And I'll see you guys soon.